A lot of you are asking about last week. I was uh, with a friend of mine in Perth. Who's, uh, some of you know Robert Duncan. He started a new church up there. And uh, it's not been going that long. And I had, I had both a wonderful and, uh, and slightly stretching experience, I guess. I kind of, as in this room, there's 20 of them. And it's not the usual profile of people that plant a new church. They were all very grey uh, folks. They were, they were older generation mostly. And. Uh, and I'm, at the end, I sort of preached a little bit and shared some of the things that were happening with us and, and, and didn't really know what to do then. I thought, well, this is lovely and lovely to be with you guys kind of thing. And, uh, and I think there was a bit of an instruction from God here that I should really expect him to show up, whatever. Uh, and, and Robert jumps up and says, it sounds so good what's happening with you. That's what we want and that's where we're going. Would you pray for us? And I'm like, well, yeah, sure. Okay, that'd be good. And I'm... I'm f- full of lack of expectation really at this point uh, but they all get out of their chairs and stand around and I'm so Holy Spirit come and I would say 19 of the 20 people got wrecked by God <laughs> and, and also being older generation there was loads of sick people to pray for I don't know if anybody got healed but I was praying for all kinds of stuff but the Holy Spirit just came on them powerfully they were hitting the floor they were shaking they were laughing they were just I thought, you can change a city with people like this. It doesn't matter how old you are. And, and I was just reminded, we, t- we can focus on young generation. and It's the, young, it's the generation that God's going to use is the anointed generation. And that's every age. All right, so the Holy Spirit comes on the, 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 the old men and the young men. Yeah, the, the women, so it's not gender specific, it's not age specific, it's just people who get the Holy Spirit. That's the generation that are going to bring in the kingdom of God. And uh, let's not get, so I was mildly corrected by the Lord on that. <laughs> so, you know, God's dealing with my sexism, my ageism, I mean, it's all just hanging out in front of you this morning. <laughs> uh, okay, we're on our... <laughs> We'll get to some preaching, hopefully, that makes sense. Uh, We're on our series about sickness. No, no, about healing. (laughs) Let's talk about being really ill. That will build us up today. (laughs) Let's share our stories of how how bad we felt. Now, this is... A lot of this... Each each message will stand on its own. But really, if you're going to get this, you really need to hear the whole thing. It's a package... And, and one or two of you have clocked that, that actually it's been deliberate, the structure, the way I've put it together. So I was talking to someone the other day and said, well, oh, the first two weeks I was totally with you. And then the third week you said that stuff. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I, whoa, but that means. And for that react, reaction start to happen on this subject of healing, because we have a whole load of baggage with us. And I know that, that what some of the things I'm saying is going to hit my baggage and your baggage. And that's the reason that I'm A, taking so long and, and taking the time to give a big backdrop to this whole thing. So the first couple of weeks particularly of covering the supremacy of the revelation that Jesus is. And, and how the shift, incredible shift that's happened from old to new covenant. It's so important you get your heads around that because you can't build your theology for healing on, uh, on Job. That's, that's not even legal. We build our theology through looking at Christ and what he did. And, and in many ways, he, he shifted the whole game. He even, he even changed things in the old covenant in order that we could see the revelation that he came to bring, which was show us the Father. So the Old Covenant was there to give us another picture to show us about sin and its power and the need of a Savior. The New Covenant shows us the Savior and gives us a a, a greater, fresher, a wider revelation of the heart of God. So yes, he is still a judge, which is what we see a lot of in the Old, but in the New, mercy triumphs over judgment. Yeah? So you have to get your head around that. The New is bigger, it's superior, it trumps the old. So we can't build on the old. We have put our heaters on, by the way, and we keep asking them to turn the fans off because it does get a bit chilly, doesn't it? Maybe hug somebody next to you. If you'd be... Just turn around. Do you mind if I have a hug? Yeah. 
Okay, by and large, we've, we've, got, a, <laughs> we've got a theology, Certain, certainly my experience, and you are shaped by your experience, and, and what tends to happen is we descri- get a theology that defines and describes our, th- our experience so that we're kind of comfortable that we are really in the will of God. Everybody, every Christian wants to be in the will of God, yeah? You don't want to be doing something that isn't what God wants. Yeah? Well, I'm talking to the right crowd today, am I? Yeah. And so we, that's our desire. So we, we, we look at our experience of, of sickness and health, and, and, and if we're struggling to see breakthroughs or we don't, we, can't, we, we want something that explains where we are because we want to be in the will of God. The trouble is if our experience is actually less than it could be or should be, we end up with an explanation that traps us where we are. So the explanation can make you comfortable where we are, can keep you where you are, and you can not see what you need to see in order to step through into other realms and other dimensions. And, and, and I'm, I'm hoping and believing that as we hit these issues that, that God will sort of open our eyes afresh and new faith will come. I, I'm so excited about the breakthroughs we've had and the healings. You know, every week we have a story. That is really good. That is really fantastic. But it still feels like it's like the cloud the size of a man's hand. You know, it's like, there's a, I was reading the, the, about the father, really, of the modern healing movement. He was actually a guy born in Edinburgh, but ending up in, a, in America. And uh, he, he set up like a healing room thing, and 100,000 people were healed in five years. Documented. Jesus John says of Jesus, if, the, if all the things that he actually did were written down, I guess the whole world couldn't contain the books. He healed multitudes of, of all kinds of diseases. So, so we're seeing something, and it's exciting, but, but we need to break through to a whole other levels of, of, of impact because the gospel is a gospel to the whole man. It's not sort of divided you up. You know, we'll save your soul and leave you sick. Actually, the gospel is intended to address the whole person. And we'll say more about that in the, in the weeks to come. So last time, we, 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 we really, I preached on Acts 10.38, and we established that sickness is from the devil. Jesus was anointed by God, and he went around doing the Father's will, which was defeating the power of the devil and uh, we established that when Jesus healed people he wasn't undoing the father's work so the father hadn't gone around making all these people sick so Jesus could come back later and make them well again because Jesus actually when put the other way when he was accused of getting demons out of people by the power of Beelzebub, he said, no kingdom divided against itself can stand. So the kingdom of heaven is definitely united. So Jesus never said, oh, the Father's made you ill, I can't fix you. It's the will of God that you're ill. Never said that. Jesus healed all who came to him. Jesus healed every kind of of disease and sickness. He went around doing the Father's work. The Father's work was healing people and delivering people. He was sent to destroy the works of the evil one. So there's a real clear line that comes in the New Testament, which is sickness is from the devil and healing is from God. And God has not made these people ill. That's come from somewhere else. God's plan is to get them well. That's what we kind of did last time, and, and some, it pushed a few buttons for some of you, and that's, that's great. That's really good. <clears throat> Jesus never said it was God's will to make you suffer, so I'll just leave you for a couple more weeks. He did say things like, the disciples were saying, this blind guy, was it his sin? Was it his parents' sin that he was born blind? I don't know how a guy's born blind because of his sin, but... The disciples sometimes were not that up to speed. Um, and Jesus just said, just said, no, this is that the works of God might be displayed in his life. 
there's a few instances where healing was a little slower around Jesus. So like the, the blind guy that first of all he prays and then, and then it, it sees men like trees walking. You remember that story? Uh, Jesus doesn't give up. He doesn't go, well, maybe it's not the Father's will. He says, no, let's, let's pray for this again. And then he gets complete clarity of vision. There's a demonized boy that, that while Jesus is up the Mount of Transfiguration, the, the, the Father brings the demonized boy to his disciples to, to get, get him well because the, the demon is throwing him into fire to kill him. And the disciples can't do it. And Jesus comes down the mountain and he doesn't say, well, you know, look, you, did, you gave it your best shot. We're just going to have to be resigned that this is the way that God wants it to be. He actually says, bring him to me. And he deals with it. And when the disciples say, well, why couldn't we deal with it? He says, well, you just weren't prayed and fasted up enough. This kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. Never did he say it wasn't in the plan. He always said there was another reason, or we need to press in, or we need to ask more. He never said, God's not in the mood for doing it today. He always said, no, the connection needs to improve this end. I mean, we need to learn to handle that. <clears throat> Even when he's in his own country, you know, and he says that he doesn't do many miraculous works, he just heals a few. The reason given isn't that it wasn't God's will. The reason given is that they had taken offense in their heart, which meant he was startled at their unbelief. It was more of a reception issue than a will of God issue. See, we need to put the difficulties at the right end of the tube, so to speak. <clears throat> so the work of God in this new era initiated by Jesus is making the blind see, is bringing healing to the leper, it's casting out demons, it, it's releasing people from every kind of disease and sickness, it's making the cripples walk and the deaf hear, it's raising the dead. That's the work of God in the era initiated and, and, and brought in by the Lord Jesus, who we are the followers of. Amen? Yeah, remember him? And our commission is to be highly dangerous to the works of the devil in this generation, in this day and age, where we are, where we sit, and where we live. And it's interesting, I think this is true, the Greek structure of going to all the world and make disciples, and it's a, you know that, that verse, of teaching them which are everything I've commanded you, Apparently the verb isn't go, but teach. So we tend to make a lot of go. Let's go, let's, let's move and plant a church. Let's go and go to the ends of the earth. And that, that, that's fine. But actually, it's really saying, as you go in life, make decide, life will take you places, then go teach, go do stuff. Go do the stuff I showed you. Go say the things I, I gave you to say. Go and release the kingdom on people where you find yourself. So you don't have to have specially gone, you've already gone. You're going tomorrow morning into all the world. And that's your opportunity to get more of God in and more of the devil out. So the big thing that bounces up in people is this whole, my title today is sickness and suffering. Is sickness suffering for the believer? Is it a way that God disciples us and trains us? Does God, because that's a classic response and, and, and it's a popular, uh, it's, it's popular theology around the body of Christ as well. Maybe God's just allowed this sickness because you're going to learn some great stuff through being ill. So if I've been pushing the button over and over again, it's God's will to heal you, it's always God's will to heal, then inside some of you is going to be, well, what about suffering? What about suffering? Doesn't it sometimes, you know, that, 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 that God allows, he may not give it, but he, he permissively allows that I might suffer, that I might grow in, in my discipleship for him. Is sickness in the same category as suffering? Of course, there is suffering in the Bible, there's suffering for the believer, and we just want to spend a few minutes looking at that. Is that okay? Anybody sitting there have that kind of question? Yes. Okay, well, that's a good, a good day to come. Uh, the, the main verse that people throw at you 
is in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. So if you want to turn that up, we're going to look at two chunks of scripture. And uh, Paul says this, just, he says, uh, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So is this a sickness that's afflicting Paul in order to keep him humble and keep him dependent on God? Well, the, the church has been talking about this for hundreds of years. And that all comes down to what is the thorn or the stake. I don't mean steak and chips, I mean steak in the ground type steak. What is this thing that is impaled in his flesh? Is it a sickness? Is it some other thing? And really, for centuries of theological debate, when you read the summaries of it, nobody really knows. I was giving you, save you a lot of reading. <laughs> um, there are contextual issues. I mean, I can tell you what I think, but you can't prove, the point I'm really making is you can't prove that this was sickness. No way can you make it out to be that. You have to read it into the text, not get it from the text. All right, that's the main point I really want to make, is you can't build a whole a whole load of thinking about the way God deals with you with sickness based on this, because it just isn't clear. It doesn't tell you what it is on purpose, I think. <clears throat> so much debate, but inconclusive. Um, when he prayed, he uses a personal term, so... Where it says, I prayed the Lord to take it away from me. It's actually more likely it might remove him from me. So it's, it's, it's not talking about an inanimate object. It's pointed towards person or persons unknown. Which I think points towards either direct demonic attack or in the context he talks a lot about all his troubles. We just read that. He's constantly, Paul is facing trouble after trouble after trouble. And when he's called at the beginning, he's actually, God tells him, you're going to suffer a lot for me. And, and, and my view is that a lot of what he's saying is his thorn, is this constant opposition, this constant pain in his life. People, you know, chucking him out of synagogues. He was stoned and beaten with rods. He was lowered over, over a wall in a basket. On and on and on and on. I remember years ago, the kids here did a did a, a, a little play about the life of Paul and you know they just read out all these persecutions and disasters and shipwrecks I mean the guy just had trouble for breakfast dinner and tea I would be crying out to God can you not take this from me and the other thing most Christians forget to do is read the first bit which says because of the abundance of amazing revelations so even if this was about sickness, the first question you should ask yourself is, do you have an abundance of amazing revelations taken up into the third heaven on a you know, regular basis, anybody? I mean, I'm hoping that that happens to us more and more. But you can't build, you can't build your doctrine of healing on this scripture. It's just not legal by any sense of both contextually and clarity. It lacks both. Uh, and yet, because we've had 1,800, 2,000 years of Christian experience with very little supernatural impact, we've looked for verses that support our experience. You see what I've been saying about this? So we, gra we gravitate to that because, well, you know, we're not seeing a lot of people healed. In fact, for centuries we saw nobody healed. So surely sickness must be God's will because we're not seeing any other kind of results. 
So if it's God's will, then it must be doing something, so maybe this scripture applies. You see, that's kind of the logic that can happen to us if we let our experience define our theology. And I think what's been happening over probably a hundred years or more is our experience is changing, so it makes us go back to scripture to re-examine, re-examine our doctrine and theology. Are you, are you, do you see? And the more we do that, I think the more light is coming to us that we get a better understanding of what Jesus uh, is actually saying about this. So if you turn with me to James 5, as there are other other sections of Scripture, here there is clarity. In that passage, there isn't clarity. You always should interpret the unclear from the clear. That's a principle of exegesis. We interpret... Things that we're not sure about from things that are absolutely clear. And hopefully we've made a lot of clarity in the last few weeks about Jesus and the will of the Father being expressed through the life of Jesus. But just in case, uh, James 5 is just so, so helpful. Uh, Verse 13. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. All right, note that. I love James's categories. And remember that James starts in chapter 1, says, count it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials, because the testing of your faith produces perseverance, etc., etc. So he says, if you're in suffering and trial, pray, and count it joy. That's his instruction. Celebrate trouble. Is anybody cheerful? Let him sing praise. Anybody happy today? Okay, that's two categories. If we had divided the room up, you know, with some people in trouble, well, let's pray for you. Some people happy, well, let's have a worship time. Third category. Is anybody sick? Well, you don't go to the other two groups. The sick people go to the elders for the elders to discern whether God's will is to heal you or not. Ooh. Oh, excuse me. Is any of you sick? Let him go to the doctor. And the scalpel of faith will bring you back to life. <laughs> Nick knows I've got nothing against doctors. It's all right. It's just... but, but I'm just sort of joking because sometimes that's how we read into this stuff. No, it says anybody's sick... Don't join, join the prayers, don't join the celebrators, go to the elders of the church and let them pray, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick or heal the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Huh. And if he's committed any sins, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power and it's working. Whoa. Jesus has made us righteous people. That means we have great power when we pray for the sick. Yay. Do you see? He's saying, happy, praise, suffering, pray, sick, get well. Yes. Should we do that again? Okay. So, do, suffering, pray. So, what do we do when we're suffering or in trouble? Pray. If we're happy, we sing. sing. If we're sick, yeah. call the elders, get prayer, and get well. That's a bit too long for a response, though, isn't it? Yeah. But you get the idea. So that's nice and clear. I like those simple things like that, don't you? Yes. You kind of know where you stand with verses like that. <laughs> So the clear injunction of scripture is if you're ill, get prayer to get well. It doesn't say discern, is this a messenger of Satan? It says get rid of it. Now, I'm not saying we don't have trouble and we don't have trials. I I think there are, just talk about it very quickly, that there are maybe three categories of trials. There's just life. Jesus said, in the world you'll have trouble. Rubbish happens, to clean up an old quote. 
Um, we live in a fallen world. It's just a you know, there's, there's chaos, there's fallenness, there's fallen humanity, there's a fallen planet, there's a fallen... We live in, in just a mess. Rubbish happens to you all the time. Jesus said, cheer up. I've overcome the world. There's persecution. Most of the suffering scriptures in the New Testament are actually related to persecution. So it's the trouble you have for believing what you believe and following who you follow. Jesus said it would happen. He actually said, woe to you if all men speak well of you. So you can look it up in 1 Peter 4.12. Rejoice. It's a pr- actually, we are commanded to rejoice when we're persecuted. It's a privilege to suffer for believing what we believe. It's a privilege to be ridiculed. It's a privilege to be ignored. It's a privilege to be stoned. Yeehaw. And there is outright demonic attack. Sometimes veiled, sometimes not veiled. But Ephesians 6 talks about standing firm, being strong in the Lord that you may stand on the evil day. And as a a Bible teacher friend of mine says, what that means, it's like a day. Because the devil isn't omnipotent. He isn't everywhere like God is. So he has to choose his strategies carefully. But some days there are evil days when he kind of gets all his big guns and he aims them all at you. And he fires them all at once. That's an evil day. And the biblical injunction is stand on that day. And the purpose of these, the trouble in life, the persecution and demonic attack, God takes hold of all that because he, he disciplines us as kids. He tests our faith in order that we would grow in faith and that we would grow in perseverance and we would become mature, complete and lacking nothing is what it says in James, James 1. So he's treating us as sons as he allows us to go through this broad category called suffering slash trouble. And those things, those demonic attacks, those, those persecutions, those troubles of life are, are there designed for us to grow strong in faith, for us to draw near to him and for us to be mature and lacking nothing as Christians. And they're a sign that he's our dad and that we're not illegitimate sons and daughters. But in none of it is there sickness mentioned. That's a separate category. Remember, if you're in trouble... If you're happy, if you're sick, yeah, get prayer and get well. I don't think you can really get obvious biblical support to say that suffering is an implicit category. Sorry, sickness is an implicit category of suffering. Find me a Bible verse that says that in the New Testament. Remember Job is not our base for this. Jesus is. All right? Jesus trumps Job. Jesus reveals more to us about God than Job does. Job tells us some important stuff. Don't don't misunderstand me here. But, you know, we don't still circumcise our kids, although it's in the Bible. Why? Because Jesus came. Hallelujah. We don't kill our enemies with swords. Why? Because Jesus came and we love our enemies. We don't kill them or shoot them. But that's in the Bible. So why should we say that Job is the defining instance that tells us how we should relate to sickness when it's in the old covenant and Jesus instituted a new and better covenant on better promises and made the old obsolete? It'll drop. It's coming. I have some philosophical, logical struggles with the idea that God makes you ill to train you and make you a better Christian. Number one is most evangelicals, which is our kind of roots, would flatly disagree with the idea of any kind of asceticism. It's not a new form of of glue. Asceticism is... The punishment of your body, either by inflicting pain or denying it some basic pleasures and rights in order to achieve a purity of soul. 
So it can be like extreme fasting, self-flagellation, all that kind of... So it's, it's doing... At, the, at its worst, it's doing you harm in order to theoretically do you good spiritually. Yeah? That's what asceticism is. And most evangelicals would you know, allow for fasting in, in, in a sensible way, which is, I think is absolutely biblical. But asceticism is it, this crazy stuff. You look at the Desert Fathers in the 3rd century. They did all kinds of weird things to themselves. And that, that in order to be more spiritual. And uh, it's really rooted in an in a, in a undervaluing and seeing, it's seeing the material as evil. It's, it's, a, it's a philosophical position that says everything that material is evil and what is spiritual, spirit is good. But actually the Bible doesn't say that. Actually we're going to have new bodies. So we, there is material life beyond death. It looks different to this life, but there will be a new heaven and a new earth of which you will be part and you get a new body. Material is cool. Jesus, God made you and said it was good. He didn't say the spirit is good but, you know, the body is bad. So kill the body off as much as you can in order to release the spirit. That is not Christianity. So why do we develop a theology about sickness that says God would do harm to our bodies to make us more spiritual? That's asceticism by God. That's mental, in my view. Can we say that again? We have a theology that says God would implement asceticism on us do actual physical harm, sometimes long-term harm to our bodies in order to make us more spiritual, and yet we don't believe that's right for us to do that to ourselves. Quite rightly so. That makes no sense. That's dangerous. That's undervaluing the physical. That's saying God's trying to kill your physical in order to make you more spiritual. That's a heresy. Did you get that point? I thought it was a really good point. In contrast, Jesus' ministry revealed the glory of God through raising the dead and healing the sick. If it's true that making you sick gives glory to God, we should queue up for the hospital. Let's get as many Christians sick and in hospital to give more glory to God as possible. We should be praying for the, not for the sick, but to get sick. I'm just making some logical extensions of the teaching that says, God can do you good by making you sick. Well then bring it on. We should be a sickness church, not a healing church. Anybody got a disease in the room? Impart it to me, because I want to be more holy. You're getting the point. God gets glory through healing and raising people, not by making them ill. That's clearly what Jesus said and did. Read John 11 for a brilliant example. Number two, this is brand new to me. Now, it may be old to you, but this is new to me. The Bible really clearly teaches a mystical union between Christ and his church. So that we are his body on the earth. So it actually says in 1 Corinthians 6 that do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ and the whole teaching there about not having sex with prostitutes is how can you join Christ to a prostitute in immorality? Such is our identification, not just in our spirit but in our actual bodies. We are Christ's physical body on the earth. We're connected to him. So when Christ Jesus appears to the Apostle Paul on the road to uh, Damascus. He says, Saul, Saul, why?" before he becomes Paul, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What we all think, well, he was persecuting the church, but Jesus is so identified with the body that is his church that if you you poke me, you're poking him. If you kill me, you're killing him. If If you flog me, you're flogging him. You know, your body is a phenomenal healing machine. Did you know that? It's absolutely phenomenal. Just chatting a bit with Nick about this. There's loads of systems that as soon as a bug or a germ or a virus or you cut yourself or you fall off something, all kick in to make you better. 
You don't even sit there going, you know what? Come on, body, heal yourself. It just starts to. That's how you were made by God to get well if you get sick. Isn't that cool? He looked at that and said, that's really good. Put the two thoughts together. Whose body are we on the earth? Jesus. Jesus is always the right answer. Is Jesus going to slash his wrists to make him more holy? Is Jesus going to inject himself with some pox or horrible disease in order that his physical body should be better? Is he, going to, is he going to inflict upon himself such crude and horrible things? He says actually of, of the body of Christ that he cherishes and nourishes us. He feeds us and washes us with the water of his word. People who do that to themselves, we, we put them in institutions eventually. We, they, they are in you know? If you go around slashing your wrists or taking poisons into your body on purpose, we don't say, hey, well done. Great effort to be more holy. We go, oh, there's something seriously wrong with you. The penny hasn't dropped yet. If you are the body, if you are Christ's body, if you are connected, one spirit with him, if you are flesh with him, so poking you is poking him, is he going to come down and poke himself? Is he going to come down and say, Look, you're absolutely one with me, and I want to make you better, so I'm, I'm going to make you ill. We're suddenly making Jesus deranged. He wouldn't do it to you. And if you're married, you wouldn't do it to your wife. Why do we think that he does it to himself? Just, so these are philosophical and logical arguments. Are you getting the point? Jesus, we are his body. He doesn't make his body ill on purpose. That would be mental in our book. Doesn't make logical sense. His life is th flowing through us to bring health to our mortal bodies, to bring life. He says that in Romans 8, that his spirit in us is bringing life to our mortal bodies. And that is on every dimension. We get life by the spirit. We get health by the Spirit. Hello? Am I helping anybody here? If you park all the unexplained things where we don't, we don't have breakthrough, we don't have healing, into the will of God, and you start to say, it's because it's not God's will, I believe you're going to lose two things. You're going to lose faith and you're going to lose compassion. So, it's really difficult to believe for healing if you think it's God's will that you're sick. Yes. Yeah? I mean, just kind of, we need to know the word of the Lord. And if you're like, mm, well, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I'm dying of cancer because it's the will of God, it's very difficult to believe that you could be well. Yes. Hello? Remember, God's good, he heals. Devil's bad, he makes people sick. It's actually really simple. So faith needs to know the heart of God and the will of God and the plan of God. That's why Jesus over and over again, he never, never says, it's not my plan to heal you. When asked, he says, if it's your will, he says, be healed. And if you think, often it says of Jesus that moved with compassion or he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So he's not automatic, he's not a healing machine. He's a, he's a spiritual, emotional, totally connected being, person, human man who feels for people who are ill and wants to see them well because he feels their pain. If you think that it's God's will that someone's ill, you're not going to have any emotion. 
Because maybe, do, do you get the point? That's good. When you start to see this, you get in touch with the yearning of God to release people from their affliction. This is not some cold decision. This is the passion of the Savior. To heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, give sight to the blind, open deaf ears. He hates sickness. He hates to see people suffering. He came and he suffered and he died and he ministered to set people free from all that rubbish. We'll we'll get on to this next week. But accepting sickness as inevitable is undervaluing the supremacy of Christ over the work of Satan. Accepting sickness as inevitable is undervaluing the supremacy of Christ over the work of Satan. And we'll sort of unpack that in the times to come. But hopefully, as I just kind of draw this to a close you can see I hope you can feel the heart of God he wants he wants you well he doesn't like sickness he doesn't take pleasure in it he doesn't desire it for you he desires the opposite for you he desires your health he desires your deliverance he desires relief from pain not the infliction of more pain he's made your whole body to heal itself And he is the great healer. And you're made in his image. Remember that. Your own body tells you something about what he's like. He's not inflicting pain, sickness and disease on you to make you more holy. There are plenty of other ways to grow in holiness. It's another category. He wants you well. And he loves to heal. And he wants all your friends well. Even if they've had rubbish lives. And woo. <laughs> it wasn't the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Even if they've had rubbish lives and done all sorts of horrible things, Jesus wants to heal them just because he loves them. You're right. Sorry. That's all right. See you later. Jesus loves you. He wants to heal you, not make you sick. He's not inflicting pain on himself. That's madness. 